All right, on my journey from Virginia to New York City, I took the last couple of weeks of June, I was captivated again by our nation's history, mainly the founding of our nation. My son and I began our Philadelphia stop, not by stopping at the Barnes Foundation or the Philadelphia Museum of Art, but at Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. My son had never seen them. We took a journey and enjoyed hearing about our founding fathers, particularly Benjamin Franklin. After all, we're in his hometown. This stop to observe our nation's advance towards July 4th, 1776, as well as today's date, of course, is why I chose this topic for today's presentation. Stopping to first take in the 18th century history of America had a residual effect when I later visited the art museums. Now, normally I would ignore American 18th century and early 19th century works of art. All that portraiture just frankly doesn't seem interesting. But because of that history tour, because I was reminded of the enormous courage and sacrifices of our founding fathers made when they signed their names to the document we celebrate today, I took greater notice of the many portraits I saw of them. And of course, the grand historical paintings of the American Revolution. I wanna point out from the start an important detail of history. The idea of revolution did not first begin in all of the minds of these men. It really started in the minds of a few men from New England who were most affected by the onerous taxation of the colonies, John Hancock and Samuel Adams being chief among them, but a few men cannot start a revolution, much less win one, especially against the greatest superpower in the world, which England was at the time. These few men would never lead 13 separate colonies to decide to commit treason and commit to autonomy from the mother country. The how of it was too big for them individually. And that is what I want to discuss today. Now, during the last presentation in this short series, I discussed how we can identify our next step, our next project. Inspired by the vitality inherent in the works of J.M.W. Turner, I asked everyone to identify the types of ideas and activities that give us the most energy. This is an excellent place to start. I also pointed out that if our ideas and projects don't energize us, then we are thinking too small. It's easier to achieve a massive idea, according to many business experts, it's easier to achieve a massive idea or project far greater than our capabilities than it is to achieve something within our capabilities. Now that may sound pretty strange at first, but just humor me for the duration of this presentation. Do you think having some of the Excess taxes removed was able to satisfy Samuel Adams and the other colonial leaders and merchants. That was, after all, a goal of theirs, which their protests only partly achieved. The problem was the goal wasn't big enough. Complete independence was the massive project that lit a fire deep in their bellies and got their minds racing with possibilities. But the how of it was the obstacle they would have to overcome. Now, let me say off the bat that I acknowledge the moral complexities of the birth of our nation, particularly the role of slavery. My first stay back east was a visit to my alma mater, the University of Virginia grounds. The rotunda is on the grounds and designed by Thomas Jefferson. You see that right here. But brand new to the grounds of the University of Virginia is this memorial. It was the first thing I saw. And it's a monument to the slaves who helped build and maintain the university. The first slaves to break ground for the university were from Jefferson's home and farm, Monticello. And I was moved to see the personal names of the slaves, to read some of the details of their time on the grounds. Now, many freed and enslaved Africans fought in the American Revolution, and many thousands won their freedom as a result either by being manumitted or simply running away during the chaos of war. Georgia alone lost a third of its slave population during the War of Independence. And of course, there is that curious document we're going to discuss proclaiming that all men are created equal. A seed definitely planted, but which wouldn't be harvested 
until a bloody civil war had been fought 80 years later and not even fully harvested then. This painting by newly arrived German immigrant, John Lewis Krimmel, surprised me when I first saw it for the same reason it captivated the artist. A free woman of African descent is enterprising herself on the streets of Philadelphia. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania as a whole for that matter, because it was founded by Quakers, was a place with many freed slaves, as well as a culturally diverse population. You see, the Quakers believed that the light of God, the spark of the divine, was in all people, regardless of race or class. Not only was that an idea radical then, in many parts of our country, it's still radical. And it contributed to the diversity of Philadelphia's population. Now here's the description of the painting's content from the Philadelphia Museum of Art website. Quote, John Lewis Krimmel immigrated to the United States only a year before composing this scene of the market stalls of Philadelphia. With its fascinating contrasts of race, social and economic class, age and character, Pepperpot reveals the artist's delight in his new environment and captures Philadelphia's unique charms. This is the first oil painted by one of the earliest American genre painters, and it is equally exceptional for its depiction of a freed person of color at work in the city. Placed at the center of this composition, the soup vendor, known through many early 19th century accounts of Philadelphia, would bellow to passerby, pepper pot, smoking hot. The Quaker and founder of Pennsylvania, William Penn, did not believe in taking land from the native population, unlike the other colonies. One of the great painters of early American history, Benjamin West, captures this moment when Penn makes a treaty with the Native Americans. Benjamin West was an Anglo-American painter focusing on historical scenes. Now, interestingly, Benjamin West was among the founders of the Royal Academy in London and served as its president from 1792 to 1805, and then again from 1806 to 1820. Now, you may recall from last week's presentation that William Turner was also a member of that academy during this time, the artist we featured last week. Now, unfortunately, peace between the colonists and Native Americans did not last, and Benjamin West captured that reality in this work. Here we see a British military officer and diplomat, Guy Johnson, and the Mohawk chief, I'm going to probably butcher this name, Karangya Yonche, who also went by the English name of David Hill. I can see why. Johnson himself commissioned this portrait in 1776. The British, you see, made alliances with the Native American tribes to fight against the colonists during the Revolutionary War. Now here's the entire painting by John Trumbull, which I wanna focus on. It's housed in the US Capitol Rotunda. The painting depicts events that took place not on July 4th, but on June 28, 1776, when a draft of the Declaration of Independence was presented by the Committee of Five to John Hancock, the president of the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia. The document was actually signed for the most part, again, not on July 4th, but on August 2nd, 1776. I think we use the date July 4th because that is when the document was actually approved by the Congress. Now there is actually a woman's name on the Declaration of Independence. Mary Catherine Goddard was the one who printed copies of the original document that were distributed to the colonies. At the bottom of the document is written, Baltimore in Maryland, printed by Mary Catherine Goddard. 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence. You can see that list here. Even though the painting itself only depicts 42 of them, along with five who didn't sign it. Now to those who did sign it, they knew they were signing their death warrants. I don't think many of us always realize that fact when we celebrate our independence. Many of the signers went into hiding as soon as the war started, for the British soldiers were given orders to immediately arrest any of the signers if they had the opportunity. 
Now, what do you think went through the minds of the signers of the Declaration of Independence? They knew this document was an act of treason and also an act of war. Now, how in the world was a ragtag collection of colonies without a trained army going to defeat the greatest superpower in the world? Let's look at the Trumbull painting again. The clue to the future success, success excuse me, of the revolution lies, I believe, in this painting. The founders did not ask the how of the monumental task. They asked the who of it. Who do we need to help win this war? The idea of who versus how was made clear to me after I read this book, Who Not How by Dan Sullivan and Dr. Benjamin Hardy. It recently came out. The book is a perfect example of the author's idea. Dan Sullivan learned the idea of who not how from Dean Jackson, a, a friend and a marketer. Dan had the idea to write the book, but he didn't actually write any of it. Benjamin Hardy wrote the book, picking from the notes of Dan Sullivan. Who do I need to write a commercially viable book, Dan asked. I highly recommend that book for anyone whose ideas seem too big to achieve. I'm briefly showing the book to you to imprint the suggestion on you. So the colonies united to go to war with Britain and it was this collective group of who's that brought unity of thought and action. But the colonial army would need more than ideas to carry them to an impossible victory. It needed the wealth of these men to fund the war and they got it. And they needed each of their respective skills and gifts to contribute to the cause, and they got it. Right before they signed the document, Benjamin Franklin reportedly said, quote, we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately, unquote. So the founding fathers all had skin in the game, Take a good look at all of these men. According to a documentary I saw, five would be tortured and subsequently died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Nine of them actually lost their lives fighting in the Revolutionary War. Several went bankrupt. Now, I'll share with you one story from a fellow Virginian, Thomas Nelson Jr., whose house you see here. Now, I don't have any good portraits of him, so I used an image of his home. British General Cornwallis seized it and used it as his headquarters during the decisive battle at Yorktown, Virginia. I'm sorry, I think that's Admiral Cornwallis. If I'm, I could be mistaken. There. But it was this battle at Yorktown which gave the final victory to the states and won the war. Now, at one point in the battle, Nelson turned cannons onto his own home to attack the British inside. And he raised $2 million, an enormous sum back then, to support the rebel cause and ended up losing his property completely. When the Continental Congress would not pay back the debts he had incurred during the war, he became destitute. And he died bankrupt at the age of 50. So the key to their winning a war against the world's greatest superpower at the time was answering the who question. Now let's take a look at some of the key who's that helped birth this country. They would need the military and leadership skills of this man, George Washington. This image also painted by John Trumbull is owned by the Met in New York City. Trumbull actually served on George Washington's staff early in the war as an aide de camp. He depicts Washington in his finest military wares. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm not sure he actually dressed this way on the eve of the battle. But it does capture the esteem in which Washington was held after his decisive victory the following day. Now, you see his horse behind him is very excited and must be held in check by Washington's aid. It really gives you a sense of the intensity of the moment. Washington seems to be conceiving his plans of attack, or perhaps he's looking off for divine inspiration. 
Another artist who documented the events of our independence was John Singleton Copley. He earned his bread and butter painting the portraits of the wealthy citizens of New England. He painted some of the most important figures of the revolution. Now, many of you know about Paul Revere's famous ride to warn the colonial militia about the British advancing toward Lexington and Concord. Samuel Adams, you see on the right here, was one of the patriots who might have been arrested along with John Hancock if Revere had not given the warning. Adams was one of the rowdiest and most defiant early voices for revolution. John Hancock on the left used his wealth from his Boston shipping company to fund the war. He also served as the president of the Second Continental Congress, which adopted the Declaration of Independence. Now, John Adams, like his son, his, I'm sorry, his cousin, Samuel, was an early agitator for war with England. In a letter from 1777, he wrote, let justice be done through the head, though the heavens should fall. Let justice be done, though the heavens should fall. Adams was known as the mind of the revolution and thought the war was mainly an intellectual revolution. In October, 1774, he drafted the principal clause of the Declaration of Colonial Rights, which was one of the first salvos for autonomy from England. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, traveled to France and used his diplomatic skills to secure French assistance for the war. Lafayette and French officers and soldiers were other important who's we needed for victory. Would we have won if not for the assistance of France and Germany? He also helped negotiate the 1783 Treaty of Paris, which ended the conflict. But it is this portrait of Franklin that I saw at the Philadelphia Art Museum that I really like. Instead of Franklin's diplomacy skills on display, it points to his inventive genius, like that of many early Americans, which helped set the young republic on its way and establish the young republic's standing in the world. Now for a moment, just think of all the technologies that were created and developed on the American soil. Harnessing electrical power, of course. And then there's Cyrus McCormick inventing the mechanical reaper, which made harvesting on the large scale possible. So many examples of creative genius birthed on American soil that it's hard to list, but here are several. The list comes from alcation.com. Things as ordinary as hearing aids, cardiac defibrillators, radiocarbon dating, traffic lights, microwave ovens, assembly lines, lasers, LEDs, GPS, chemotherapy, and of course, mobile phones, personal computers, and the internet. And my personal favorite, chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth Graves Wakefield. This inventive American spirit was already fully on display before the revolution in Benjamin Franklin's innovative curious and business-centered mind. Then of course, we have the author of the declaration himself, Thomas Jefferson. He too was a very creative genius, a kind of Renaissance man of early America. Besides being a philosopher, statesman, farmer, and an architect, he invented or improved upon several unique items. He improved upon the plow, creating an iron version, which dug deeper and lasted much longer than wooden versions. He modified a Windsor chair to create a swivel chair. He created a calendar clock using cannonballs. He invented a polygraph, not the lie detector machine, but a copying machine. And let's not forget, he invented the macaroni machine. <laughs> yes, all of you mac and cheese lovers, you can thank Thomas Jefferson for that dish. Then there is, of course, his writing skills. In reality, the writing of the Declaration was a collaborative affair. Jefferson wrote the initial draft, but Benjamin Franklin and John Ed Adams edited much of it. Now this work is owned by the Met as well. It's an enormous painting, 12 feet, five inches by 21 feet, three inches. 
I'd like to finish this presentation by focusing on this work. Even though it was painted in 1851, it tells us something important about revolutions. There's a lot of movement in this work, lots of energy with the one exception of the tall figure standing in the boat, George Washington. He is the only one in regal profile. His expression is one of absolute determination. This moment, when the rebel army carried out successfully a sneak attack on the British forces at Trenton was the turning point in the war. Before this moment, Washington had experienced several defeats. The Continental Army was disheartened to say the least, but this victory gave the troops the most necessary resource for winning a war, hope. But this painting is much more than simply a depiction of a decisive moment in the Revolutionary War. It was painted by Lutze, not in America, but in Dusseldorf, Germany, and 75 years after the event it depicts. What was happening in Germany in the middle of the 19th century when it was painted? Revolutions. There were a series of revolutions in Germany during the 1840s, with citizens wanting more say in government. Unfortunately, these revolutions all failed. Lutze, who was sympathetic to the revolutionary's cause, wanted to provide hope, but he also wanted to point out what else is required to win revolutions. Look at the variety of people in Washington's boat. Look at how they're dressed, emphasizing that they all come from different places and have different backgrounds. Revolutions require people of diverse backgrounds to come together. Now remember, we had French and German soldiers and generals helping us out. We had merchants joining laymen. We had trappers and other frontiersmen joining city dwellers to make this moment possible. Lutze even put in a man of African descent. For me, this painting represents the diversity of who's that made independence not only possible, but achievable. Think again about your next move. What is it that you want to accomplish? If your next project doesn't vitalize every cell in your body, if it doesn't bring a flow of energy through your body, if it doesn't scare you to death, then is it big enough to be worth your time and commitment? The problem with finding the treasure we seek, that goal, that project, that moonshot, is that the journey seems so far, so grand, so beyond our abilities that we get stuck in the how of it. How in the world will I ever achieve this? I hope by now you are convinced that that is the wrong question. In fact, it's the question that stops anyone from accomplishing great things. The question we must ask, the question the founders of this country asked, and which makes all dreams possible, was a who question. Who do I need to accomplish this idea, this project? For example, if our project is improved health, it may take hiring a trainer or a nutritionist. Maybe those trainers or nutritionists are on YouTube providing free and valuable training so we can start there. Maybe our who is a coach of some type or someone who is tech savvy, who can build us a website or someone who has knowledge and skills in any area where we lack skills and knowledge. Maybe we are bold enough to imagine a massive project like founding a nonprofit or a business. We will need the help of many to pull it off. But that is the way all great organizations were built, not by the hand of one genius, but by many hands of uniquely talented men and women. Friends, dare we dream dreams that excite us to the point of terrifying us? Dare we imagine the impossible? It may be impossible if we get stuck in the how of it, but if we begin asking who, then even overthrowing a superpower is not impossible for us. Well, happy July 4th, everyone. I hope today we take inspiration from our founders and dare to dream big dreams.